Welcome to the Private School Leader Podcast, where private school leaders learn how to thrive and not just survive at one of the most difficult jobs on earth. I'm your host, Mark Minkus. Today's episode is part two of how servant leadership can transform your school culture. In our last episode of the Private School Leader Podcast, we defined servant leadership and talked about the five characteristics of a servant leader. And on today's episode, we are going to talk about what servant leaders do, the 10 things that they do, and how you can actually put that into action at your school. But before we do that, let's just have a quick review of the big takeaways from our last episode. First of all, a servant leader serves first and leads second. People don't want to work at a top-down command and control, do it because I said so, organization. They want to feel emotionally safe at work. Also, servant leadership is a lifestyle and not a leadership hack. And in last week's episode, we covered the five characteristics that an effective servant leader displays. And those five characteristics are, first, a true servant leader is humble. Second, displays integrity at all times. Third, a servant leader is passionate about helping others grow. Fourth, if you want to be an effective servant leader, you encourage participation that makes people feel safe. And you can do this through being approachable, visible, and having a predictable mood. And fifth, you inspire others through influence rather than your position as the leader of your private school. So on today's episode, we're going to take all this knowledge of the characteristics of a servant leader and what servant leadership is and apply it to you and your school. We're going to do this and make it super practical and talk about the 10 things that servant leaders do. But before we do that, I'd like to ask for a quick favor. You know that it's my mission to help private school leaders all over the world thrive at the schools that they serve. And I'm wondering if you can help me do that. Can you please rate and write a review for this episode? The rating helps this podcast to be heard by more leaders, and your review gives me valuable feedback so that I can better serve you in future episodes. Thanks so much for doing that. Okay, so what does a servant leader do? If you want to be a servant leader, you need to do these 10 things. Number one is listen. We are good at talking. I know I'm good at talking, uh, giving presentations, leading a staff meeting, leading a grade level meeting. I think as private school leaders, I'll just, again, speak for myself. I do a lot of talking, but we're not always as skilled at listening and asking questions. And so what true servant leaders do is they give their full focus to someone that they're listening to. And full focus means no devices. And I know that This has been something that I've had to struggle with and uh, made some improvements in this area as well. And I think that in your school, if you have to stop and think about how do people get in touch with you when you're in a meeting with someone, that you're listening to them, you're trying to listen intently without interrupting, and then act on that information that you receive, you have to ask yourself, What is the definition of an emergency that someone needs to interrupt that meeting? And so for me at my school, it's a walkie-talkie, and they know that they can get me there. And so I ignore my texts. I ignore my phone on my desk, the intercom phone that's ringing. And I just think that true emergencies in our school are much more rare. And sometimes it's that other person's definition of an emergency. And so just as much as you can to set aside that device and to eliminate those distractions when you're really trying to listen to that person. I really believe that we have a listening crisis in our country, and there's so many things that are noisy, whether it's social media or advertising. Sometimes you drive down the main street in your town, and it looks more like the Vegas Strip with all the uh, electronic signs and all the things that you see and hear. Well, with this listening crisis, I think it's really, really rare for someone to feel heard. And you've had that experience, hopefully a time or two where someone says, I really feel like you heard me. Well, servant leaders listen 
And we need to really use that active listening without interrupting and then act on the information that we receive. So what is our action step? What are we going to do with this? Listen without thinking about what you're going to say when the other person stops talking. Because listening with the intent to respond is not listening. So action item for listening is do not listen with the intent to respond. All right, on to number two. We're doing the 10 characteristics of a servant leader. And number two is show empathy. Show empathy. And of course, we know that empathy means understanding how people feel and why they feel that way. To just recognize and accept the people for their uniqueness and try to understand their point of view. And I think for me, empathy really has to do with remembering that this person is a human being first and a teacher or a parent second. And we really have to get to know our teams. We really have to get to know our people as human beings, their likes and their dislikes, their interests, what's important to them. Why are they so passionate about that particular thing? I'm not a cyclist. I'm not a long distance runner, but I have some teachers who are, and they're so passionate about that. Um, there's other things that I don't understand just because I haven't experienced them or because that's not my preference, but it's important to them. The other thing, when we put ourselves in their shoes, we have to remember as human beings that they go through difficult times. And whether it's the loss of a loved one or worried about a child um, that's having difficulties, whatever it might be, to try to put ourselves in their shoes and to see them as a human being first and as a teacher or a parent second. And you can disapprove of the behavior or disagree with the point of view and still respect the humanity of that person. So let's pause right there for a second and just listen up. I want to say that one more time. Empathy as a servant leader means that you can disapprove of the behavior or disagree with the point of view and still respect the humanity of that person. So what's our action item for number two, showing empathy? This is what I want you to do. I want you to pretend that you're putting on a pair of magic glasses that allow you to see, hear, and think the way that person sees, hears, thinks, and feels. So number two, show empathy. What you're going to try to do is to think about putting on a pair of magic glasses that will allow you to see, hear, think, and feel the way that person does and when you're having that conversation. All right, so the 10 characteristics of a servant leader. Servant leaders listen. Number two, they show empathy. And number three, they provide healing. So what does that mean to provide healing? Well, we have to remember and acknowledge that people have been hurt in their lives. Some of it may have been from their personal life or from childhood. Some of their hurt may be from a previous workplace environment that was toxic. You may not think it's fair to inherit the problems that go along with this person, but servant leaders recognize that they have an opportunity to make people whole. I want you to hear that again. As servant leaders, as leaders of our private schools, we have an opportunity and a privilege to help make people whole. And when you lead, you have a responsibility to heal. Now, you're not their therapist, but you can provide predictability and support, especially a predictable mood. And servant leaders make it a top priority to intentionally create an emotionally safe and fun work environment. And so stop and think about that for a minute and ask yourself the question, well, what am I doing to make my school emotionally safe? Allowing that participation in meetings or uh, when that person comes to have uh, to talk with you, uh, what am I doing to support them when they have a parent that is being completely out of bounds and being emotionally abusive? What kind of support do I provide? And what about fun? You know, school should be fun. 
And not all the time, but it should be an emotionally safe and fun work environment. And you have to remember that sometimes people have never experienced a work environment like that. And so servant leaders see the opportunity to help people heal is a privilege. And people that have been hurt find it difficult to trust others, especially people in positions of authority like yourself. You must keep your promises and build trust. So when we look at characteristic number three, provide healing, we have to remember that people come to us with all their hurts. Some of them are emotional hurts from their childhood or things that have happened in their lives. And some of it is from a toxic workplace environment. But whatever we inherit, it's our responsibility to help them heal. And so what's the action step for this one, number three, provide healing? Have a predictable mood and apologize when you mess up. It's plain and simple. Just have a predictable mood as hard as that is, but also when you mess up, apologize. I found that to be a real game changer that I just accept it. I don't get try not to get defensive and I just try to own it and apologize when I mess up. All right. So the 10 characteristics of a servant leader. Number one, listen. Number two, show empathy. Number three, provide healing. And number four, show awareness. So what do I mean when I say that servant leaders must show awareness? Well, you must have a really good understanding of your strengths and weaknesses to have that self-awareness that we demonstrate and that our level of patience, my temper, my mood, my communication style, and how all of that is received, I have to be very self-aware of how that is being received by the people in my school community. And so the problem with that is, is that if I just evaluate myself, then most of the time I'm going to think, well, I'm doing just fine. And most private school leaders have that same problem. And I'll just say that early in my career that I did not really want to get feedback because I was insecure, because I was a younger leader. But one of the ways to become more self-aware and to really know how these things are being perceived by those on your teams and in your school community is to set aside our egos and accept feedback from our coworkers or the board president or the head of school or the teachers. And we should seek that anonymous feedback from our teachers and staff. And you might say, well, why anonymous? I want someone to put their name to it if they have something to say about me. Well, here's the thing. Do you really want to know what they think? Do you really want to grow as a leader? Because uh, an anonymous forum, an anonymous Google forum, really that's how they're going to be honest is behind that anonymity. And then you can decide what to do with that feedback. You also must demonstrate an awareness of all situations, especially group dynamics and accurately assessing how big or small a problem really is. All right, so come back to me for a second. Let me hit you with that again. Self-awareness for a servant leader, showing awareness as a servant leader, part of that is group dynamics, what's going on in the group, on the staff, in the middle school team, in the lower school team, and also assessing how big or small a problem really is. So we've all heard that phrase, making a mountain out of a molehill. You don't wanna be known as the person who makes small problems into huge deals and when something's an actual real problem that you just kind of ignore it and it's not that big of a thing. So you have to get this feedback so that you can be self-aware, that you can know how your leadership is being perceived, how it's being felt by those who are following you. So what's the action item for this step? Create an anonymous feedback form for your staff at least once a year, preferably twice a year. Create that anonymous feedback form so that they can give you feedback on your leadership. It's hard to do. I told you. I said that I had a hard time with that early in my career, but a servant leader shows awareness. All right, we're up to step number five 
for the characteristics of what a servant leader does. What do servant leaders do? And the next behavior, number five, is use persuasion. And in a lot of the research, it says that this is one of the biggest indicators of whether or not someone is actually a servant leader. So if you're multitasking, just come back to me. If you're driving and distracted, or if you're working out, or if you're doing errands and you're kind of drifting, I want you to just come back to me for a minute. I want to read that again. Using persuasion effectively is one of the biggest indicators of whether or not someone is actually a servant leader. Servant leaders rely on persuasion and not their positional authority. So positional leadership and servant leadership are diametrically opposed. If you are a positional leader, that means that people have to listen to you because you're the boss, because I said so, and that's how we're going to do it. That's not the kind of leader that you want to be. You want to seek consensus and buy-in through collaboration and persuasion rather than by exerting your power and authority. And so think about it this way. You want to seek cooperation, not coercion. You want to seek cooperation and not coercion. You want to try to build consensus and get buy-in and not go down the path of, well, we'll do it this way because I said so. And some people, I think sometimes persuasion gets a bad rap that someone thinks of the word persuasion and thinks that it's a bad term, it's a bad word. You think of slick sales tactics from a used car salesman that's, um, you know, that might come to mind, but you're not a used car salesman that's selling a lemon to an unsuspecting old lady. If you use persuasion and you use it well, you are trying to collaborate and get buy-in and not use your authority or abuse your authority, but have more teamwork to get to the eventual outcomes and decisions that the team makes. And so what's the action step for number five, which is use persuasion? Very simply, ask more than you tell. I'll say that one more time. Ask more than you tell. All right. We're halfway through our list of ways that servant leaders demonstrate they are servant leaders. Um, What do servant leaders do? Number one, they listen. Number two, they show empathy. Number three, they provide healing. Number four, they show awareness. Number five, they use persuasion. And number six, servant leaders demonstrate conceptual thinking. They demonstrate conceptual thinking. Okay, so what does that mean? So I want to hit you with a quote from Dr. John Maxwell. He's a leadership expert, and he said, A leader is one who sees more than others see, who sees farther than others see, and who sees before others see. So you know, if you think about that for a moment, that that really is one of the key components of leadership, is that you're seeing it before others do, and you're anticipating, and you're making decisions based on that. A servant leader must always view things through the lens of where are we going as a school. And it's so easy to allow the tyranny of the urgent to rule the day. Just get through the day, just get through this next event, put the thank yous in the daily memo, and then get on to the next event. And I used to think this way for sure. It was just kind of like going on that hamster wheel and getting from event to event, from decision to decision, from day to day. But it will cause your school to stagnate. Your teachers will be less motivated. It will impact teacher attrition, and it will um, impact student turnover, student um, departures. And so one of the things that you need to do as a servant leader is to demonstrate that conceptual thinking and Your teachers can't get motivated by a vision if your day-to-day behavior makes it clear that you've lost sight of the vision and that you're just putting out fires all day. And I get it. We have to put out fires, but you also, as the leader, it's our responsibility to demonstrate that conceptual, visionary, into-the-future thinking. Your board should be mostly conceptual in their orientation and your teachers should be mostly operational in their orientation, and servant leaders are called to seek the delicate balance between conceptual thinking and day-to-day operational approach. So 
I want to really emphasize that and I want to just read it to you one more time. Your board should be mostly conceptual. The teacher should be mostly operational, but a servant leader is the one who can balance between conceptual and day-to-day operational thinking. So how do we as servant leaders demonstrate conceptual thinking? Well, the action step for this one is to schedule 30 to 60 minutes a week where you work on things that are going to happen more than one year in the future. 30 minutes a week, preferably 60 minutes a week, where you're working on things that happen more than one year in the future. And if you get into the habit, you're not going to be able to keep that appointment with yourself every single week. But if you get into the habit of that thinking ahead by one year or more, you are going to demonstrate that conceptual thinking and you are going to keep your school growing and thriving instead of becoming stagnant. All right, number seven. Servant leaders do these 10 things. And the seventh thing on our list is that servant leaders display foresight. Okay, display foresight. What does that mean? Well, it's going to sound pretty obvious, but this is actually really important. You learn from the past, you apply it to the future so that your team and your school can grow. So you display foresight by learning from the past and applying it to the future. And when Navy SEALs conclude a mission, They always file what they call an AAR, which stands for After Action Report. The SEALs talk about what went well, what did not go well, what they can do better the next time. Rank goes out the window and the SEALs can say anything they want to the commander of the team. Um, Jocko Willink wrote a book called Extreme Ownership and gets into a lot about the After Action Report and applies it to leadership. But a leader needs to, a servant leader needs to display that foresight. And we need to be able to do that by reviewing, debriefing, and then applying that to the future. So what's our action step for number seven? Well, make it a practice to debrief after events like Grandparents Day or the winter concert or standardized testing or field day. And while it's better to debrief in a meeting, Getting feedback in a Google form is better than not debriefing or not getting feedback at all. And so um, then you could have a Google Doc for the entire year and just paste the feedback in there and then come back to it later in the late spring or early summer as you're trying to improve events for the following year or improve best practice or improve hiring practice or onboarding for new employees or whatever it might be. You have to evaluate and assess all of the things that you do, or you will continue to do them the same way. So if you don't want to do the same things the same way year after year after year, then you need to debrief, assess, and apply that knowledge to the future. So 10 things that servant leaders do. Number one, listen. Number two, show empathy. Number three, provide healing. Number four, show awareness. Number five, use persuasion. Number six, demonstrate conceptual thinking. Number seven, display foresight. And number eight, practice good stewardship. So just before we get into stewardship, I just wanted to remind you, I'm listing off 10 things here. And that's a lot, especially when you're driving or if you're running errands or if you're working out or uh, cutting the grass or going for a walk, whatever it might be. So in the show notes, which you can find at theprivateschoolleader.com slash episode six, everything will be there for you. And then you can go back to that and refer to it another time, but you won't have to try to remember all 10 things. Okay. Number eight, practice good stewardship. A good steward is responsible for something and then takes really good care of it. And the definition, the dictionary definition, maybe leaves a little to be desired, but I I like to think about a, a gardener, someone who's responsible for a garden, and if they are a good steward of that garden. So what would that person do? Well, they would make sure that the plant they were planted all of the the um, vegetables or crops or or flowers were planted at just the right time that the soil was tilled up and and fertile they would water 
They would pull weeds. They would make sure that it was getting enough sunlight. They would fertilize. This gardener would also maybe build a little fence around it to keep the pests out from eating all of the vegetables. So they would do all of the little things that needed to be done to take good care of that garden. And that is a good steward. So how are you a good steward as a servant leader leading your private school? Well, the responsible planning and management of resources is the way that you demonstrate that. And by resources, I mean time, energy, money, facilities, whatever is a resource at your school, time being one of the biggest ones. Stewardship also means that your leadership is ethical and authentic because If you really want to take good care of something, you have to have ethical leadership and you have to have authentic leadership, or you're going to make decisions that will cut corners and not be in the best interest of the organization. So you demonstrate a commitment to serving and placing others' needs above your own, and that's how you demonstrate good stewardship. So what's our action item for number eight? Every time that you use school resources, ask yourself this question. Is this decision in the best interest of my students? Whatever resource you use, whether it's time, money, a facility, uh, an event, is this decision in the best interest of my students? Okay, we're getting there. Number nine on the list of 10 things that servant leaders do. Servant leaders commit to helping their people grow. So a true servant leader recognizes that every team member has value as a human being and not just as an employee. And so you must be fully invested in helping your people grow professionally and emotionally, and that means that you take an interest in what's going on in their lives outside of school. And another thing is that you provide meaningful professional development. And I can remember early in my career where I was kind of afraid to really pour a lot of time, energy, money, resources, and professional development into teachers because I thought, well, they're just going to upgrade their certification and then they're just going to leave and they're going to go to the public school. And that thinking stagnated our school and our staff. And so developing meaningful professional development opportunities for your staff is key. And so What does that mean? Well, we have to be creative and PD does not have to cost a lot of money. Sometimes it does, but it does take time to plan and execute. And this could be anything from attending a national conference, which is a lot of money, to choosing a relevant webinar topic on Edutopia's website, and then coming up with discussion questions. That's free. Um, It just takes some effort. It takes some vetting of those webinars on Edutopia or other websites that are professional development rich. Don't forget that I've created three free plug and play PD webinars for you to use with your teachers. And you can find them over at the private school leader.com. And the three webinars that are available to you for free uh, and they have, uh, they have guided notes, they have discussion questions. The three of them are how to build effective relationships with difficult parents the seven habits of highly effective private school teachers and how to turn pedestal kids into gritty kids by implementing growth mindset. So all of that is available for you for free over at the private school leader.com. And you could use that as a plug and play PD where the teachers watch the video and you, they use the guided notes and then you engage with the discussion questions and that's there for you for free. So I'm trying to take away the excuses. Uh, You can also go to your state or national private school associations like NAIS or NCEA or ACSI or Prisma. Go to their website, start checking out the variety of PD opportunities that they have for your teachers. But the action item is to develop and provide meaningful professional development opportunities for your team. And number 10, Servant leaders build community. Servant leaders build community. Every person craves connection. We all crave community. We we want to be part of a family or a team or a congregation or a fan base. 
And that's why there are literally millions of online communities right now for everything from Star Wars to quilters to Civil War reenactors to marathoners to tattoo artists to tropical fish enthusiasts, and the list goes on and on and on. And they have community. Why? Because they crave that. People who have things in common. And servant leaders recognize the desire for connection in their school, and they intentionally build a strong school community with strong relationships. And so as servant leaders, we have to recognize that there's a difference between a team and a community. They're, they're on the staff. They're on the part of the faculty because they work there and they've agreed to work there. But a school community is something that's a level above that, and it has to do with culture. And we'll talk more about culture in future episodes, but there's a difference between a faculty and a community. There's a difference between a team and a community. So how, what's your action step for this? Well, to build community, you want to provide opportunities for social interaction and meaningful collaboration. So there have to be some times where your teachers can be social with each other. Most of them will probably like each other and probably do like each other, but they're so busy that they don't get that time and that will not grow community if those social interaction times just don't exist. And also meaningful collaboration, that they're pulling together on the same rope, that they're moving in a direction that's meaningful and that it is something that they did together. And the other thing is to provide rally points for your school, like spirit days or uh, the hundredth day of school, um, field day. You know, a lot of schools have these things already, but there are certainly um, many different ways to provide rally points where it's a little bit fun and reminds us that we can all dress up. We can have a fun time. We can do certain things together, uh, pep rallies, whatever the case might be, that just build that school spirit, but also remind everyone that we're part of this school community and that we're proud to be part of this school. Okay, so what are the big takeaways from today's episode? Servant leaders always serve first and lead second. And we learned that servant leaders do 10 things. Servant leaders listen. They show empathy. Number three, they provide healing. Number four, show awareness. Number five, use persuasion. Number six, demonstrate conceptual thinking. Number seven, display foresight. Number eight, practice good stewardship. Number nine, commit to helping their people grow. And number 10, build community. So that's a big long list. And with your call to action this week, your big call to action, I just want you to pick one, and I'm actually going to suggest one for you. And that's number two, show empathy. And so your task for this week is that when you're in a meeting with a parent or a teacher this week, I want you to put on those magic glasses that let you view the world through their eyes and be really, really intentional about showing empathy. And just try that this week to, again, in your mind, put on those imaginary magic glasses that help you view the world through their eyes and see if it creates more empathy on your part in that meeting. That's your call to action. So let's wrap it up. I hope that you got value from this episode. The Private School Leader Podcast exists to help you thrive and not just survive at one of the most difficult jobs on earth, serving and leading your private school. And from one private school leader to another, I know that you have very, very specific issues that you face at your school. And my goal is to just help you and serve you and use my 30 years of experience to help you not make the same mistakes that I've made and to help you learn the things that I wish I had known. I want to help you get from where you are today and how you're feeling about yourself as a leader to help you feel less exhausted and more inspired and feel like you're rocking it every day. And that's why this episode, that's why this podcast exists. And I've got a free resource for you in addition to the plug and play PDs that I mentioned earlier. And it is over at the private school leader.com slash guide. And it is the six things that every private school leader teacher wants from their leader. The six things every private school teacher wants from their leader. And this is a six page PDF. And I really believe it can be a game changer for you. And I just really guarantee you that if you do these six things, the teachers at your school are going to want to follow you anywhere. 
So be sure to subscribe to this podcast so that you never miss an episode. You can find the show notes for today's episode by going to the privateschoolleader.com slash episode six. And a new episode of the Private School Leader podcast comes out every week on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, wherever you listen to podcasts. And please connect with me on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. Look for at the Private School Leader. And if you got value from this episode, subscribe, share it with another leader or an aspiring leader at your school, and leave a rating and a review. And that helps grow the podcast so that more leaders can benefit from this podcast. I've been your host, Mark Minkus. I just want to say that I appreciate you and all the good work that you're doing as you serve your school. Thank you so much for taking some of your precious time to join me here today. And I'll see you next time on the Private School Leader Podcast. And until then, always remember to serve first, lead second, and make a difference.